We are burning daylight, as my Texas friends would say. Western Conservative Summit 2013 reconvenes right now. Hi there, Arizona. Hi there, Colorado. Hey, Colorado, how about a welcoming hand to our friends at Scottsdale, Arizona, Western Conservative Summit. Gosh, this is fun. How strong is that Ted Cruz? Let me tell you, we have, I have two data points for just how Ted Cruz makes the needle literally move. I told you we were trending well on Twitter last night. Well, it's gotten even better, but first I need to say thanks to Arizona. We weren't sure that of course, lots of folks here in this huge hall are watching the screen more consistently than the individual here at the mic, but we didn't know if in Arizona an internet video feed from a thousand miles away would necessarily hold your attention, let alone move you, but word has it that in Arizona they leapt to their feet as Cruz finished speaking and gave a standing O to a TV screen. Now that is cool. <laughs> Now, as far as what the senator called that Tweety thing, we are trending number two in little old Colorado last night. Scott Walker and Mia Love got the fire lighted. Well, friends, as of the conclusion of the Ted Cruz speech, Western Conservative Summit is trending number five in the United States on Twitter. There's 140 million Americans on Twitter, and this afternoon, Western Conservative Summit, hashtag, remember, WCS13, WCS13. We're ahead of Justin Bieber. We're ahead of the New York Yankees. We're ahead of the New York Mets. We're ahead of Detroit, and we should be, and Holy broomsticks, we're ahead of Harry Potter. <laughs> so pour it on. If you're tweeting, hashtag WCS13. Okay, Colorado Christian University, 100 years old, October 19, or 2014, founded 1914. Colorado and Arizona are flyover country no more as a result of what free people are doing with their freedom, including the educational excellence of places like Colorado Christian University and Arizona Christian University. And at CCU, we aim high. You've seen the caliber of our students so far in the summit. I want you to meet someone right now who will be aspiring into CCU's first Rhodes Scholar Award as we come into the end of 2013. I first knew her when she was one month on campus as a freshman from her native South Carolina and had inherited the editorship of the school paper at CCU, Veritas, because upperclassmen weren't going to do it. She took it on and made it hum. She has been wonderful in the Centennial Institute office this summer as we've gotten ready for Western Conservative Summit. Please now welcome for the introduction of our afternoon speaker, CCU student Haley Littleton. I have a confession to make. My name is Haley, and I live in a bubble. In Dr. Charles Murray's latest book, Coming Apart, the reader is able to take a short quiz. This quiz, titled How Thick Is Your Bubble, shows the reader how in contact or um, out of touch with the reader is with mainstream America. You can only imagine my conviction and dismay when I discovered that my self-selected socioeconomic bubble is pretty thick. According to Dr. Murray, it's no longer money that separates America's classes, but vast cultures that fail to overlap. 
This often creates political delusions and major misunderstandings. In Dr. Murray's most recent publication, American Exceptionalism, he praises the egalitarianism and aversion to class distinction found in the early United States. Its radical commitment to equality and unity created a thriving society of self-determined individuals. For Dr. Murray, these qualities are what made America exceptional um, in regards to its nation-state counterparts. These qualities, however, have largely disappeared, creating a country that would be almost unrecognizable to its founders. But Dr. Charles Murray is not a doom and gloom kind of scholar who capitalizes on pointing out modern problems without providing solutions. What makes Dr. Murray a compelling voice in today's political climate is his commitment to the methods that will reclaim that which we have lost. Charles Murray sees America as a land still ripe with opportunity if we are able to reclaim the qualities that sustain it. The American character is still, still alive if we are willing to revive the qualities and the community that make it possible. So, it is time to pop the bubble and get down to business for the sake of America's future. I personally am taking steps, uh, Murray proposed, to shrinking my own bubble, and I hope others do the same. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming American Enterprise Institute scholar and this afternoon's speaker, Dr. Charles Murray. Thanks very much, Haley. I can't tell you how depressing it is to be introduced, uh, be, to be told that uh, in preceding the introduction, that the preceding speaker not only got a standing ovation from the people sitting here, but people who were applauding a television screen in Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> However, there can't be just high points in any uh, set of speeches. You have to have time to rest, and I'm going to give you that over the next 25 minutes. <clears throat> I'm also going to say nothing whatsoever about Republican versus Democratic politics. I figure you need a rest from that, too. I'm going to talk instead about a very major problem that faces the country as a whole if we are to sustain the American project as we have historically known it. Uh, this is the thesis that I developed in the book called Coming Apart, and I'm going to have to give you a very brief synopsis of it, uh, but I want to get through that so I can deal with the a topic that Haley mentioned, what happens next? The thesis of coming apart is that over the last 50 years, we have developed classes that are different in kind from anything that the United States has ever known before. We have always had rich people and poor people. The rich people and poor people have always lived in somewhat different parts of town and, and, and been separate in some kinds of ways, but we were united in our participation in basic American institutions in ways which has changed over the last 50 years. Let me give you the paradigmatic example, the, the, the one statistic that I find most important in trying to understand what's going on. And I'm going to put it in terms of just white Americans. And the reason for that is that doing so clears away a lot of complications. Uh, nobody can say to himself or herself, well, Murray's talking about things that are really mostly a problem in this community or that community. By talking about non-Latino white Americans, th that is not a possible response. Uh, secondly, I'm going to talk about people who are in the prime of life, ages 30 to 49 years old. Uh, the time of life when people are married and having kids and getting ahead in the world. In 1960, if you talk about the uh, white upper middle class, that means educated uh, in college and working in the professions or in managerial jobs, 94% of them were married. You will have very few statistics in which you have that close to 100%. But if you take the white working class, meaning people with just a high school education, and working in blue-collar jobs or low-level service jobs, 84% of them were married. So it was a little bit less than the upper middle class, but not that much. And the main thing is that communities were overwhelmingly organized on the basis of, of married couples with children. Fast forward 50 years to 2010. 84% of whites in the upper middle class were still married. Uh, marriage is alive and well in the uh, upper middle class. Among the white working class, 48%, from 84 to 48% in 50 years. A minority of whites in the working class uh, ages 30 to 49 are now married. 
That simple statistic all by itself has reverberations for a lot of other things going on in our society. And it's reflected in such things as, for example, the change in the labor force behavior of white males ages 30 to 49. I mean, look, in 1960, if you were 30 to 49, you were male, and unless you were quadriplegic, you were supposed to be working or looking for work, and just about everybody was. As of 2008, before, before the recession hit, one out of eight white males ages 30 to 49 was not even in the labor force, not even looking for work, and moreover, that number had been rising through good times and bad, including the boom times of the 1980s and the 1990s. A fundamental change has taken place there. there there's an easy ex explanation for that, by the way, among others. There are a variety of explanations. Social science has now proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. This will tell you the power of the social sciences that marriage civilizes men. None of you knew that until I told you that, did you? Uh, and the fact is that uh, when men are not married, they don't tend to buckle down and get serious and get ahead in life the way that they do after they're married. So the reduction in marriage is implicated in what happened there. There's also been a big reduction in religiosity in the white working class. Again, the figure is one out of eight. This time, it is now in white working class communities, only one out of eight persons says both that they have a strong affiliation with their faith and that they attend worship services almost once a week or more. One out of eight. When it's only one out of eight, you're not talking about a minority that still is a powerful voice in the community. You are increasingly talking about a minority who are seen as oddballs. In the white upper middle class, there has been reduction in uh, religiosity, but not nearly as much, and you still have more than a quarter of people in the upper middle class who, who do have that kind of affiliation and, and participation in their faith. This has reverberations for still another important indicator, what the social scientists call social capital, and actually consists of neighborliness and civic activism. It involves uh, coaching little league teams and attending the PTA and making sure that the uh, little old lady across the street has her snow shoveled from her walk during the winter, things like that. Well, we know that social capital <laughs> is driven by a couple of things. It's driven by married couples who are trying to create an environment for their children, and it is driven by religion. Uh, in his famous book, Bowling Alone, the social scientist Robert Putnam uh, calculated that half of all social capital is directly religious in its origins, and there's a lot more that is generated by religious people because religious people are more active in secular forms of social capital than non-religious people are. So I'm talking about a, a series of ways in which the working class, which has historically been the spine of American society, has been crumbling. And this is not limited to statistics. If you go down to working class neighborhoods and watch what's going on, go, go into a bar and just drink a couple of beers and, and engage in conversation with people. And you will discover communities that are unraveling, that no longer function in the way that they once did. And the existence of this class, the growing class, poses a fundamental difference to historically the role that the working class class played in this country. Let me turn now to the formation of the new upper class. Until now, I've referred to the upper middle class. I'm not just referring to upper middle anymore. I'm talking about the people who run the country. And they uh, are of two kinds. You have the important people in Denver, Colorado, or Scottsdale, Arizona, people who hold the important positions in corporations here, in the political structure, in the universities, people who uh, run the TV stations, and so forth. But if you're talking about the people who affect the nation's culture and politics and economy, those are almost all concentrated in four areas of the country. Uh, the Washington, D.C. area, the New York City area, Los Angeles area, and more recently, the, the fourth nexus of, uh, of this kind of influence, Silicon Valley, stretching from San Francisco down to San Jose. What has happened over the last 50 years has been the re result of some good things that occurred. Uh, we got a lot better over the course of the 20th century in finding talented kids wherever they were and sending them off to college. That's a good thing. Uh, 
It also was true over the course of the 20th century that brains became much more valuable in the marketplace than they had been before. And people who had talent and got the education and the opportunities made a lot of money. Both of those things are good uh, in one sense. In, they're consistent with or embodiments of the American dream in one sense. But they have collateral effects. And one of those collateral effects is that a new kind of culture has evolved. And it's one which uh, many people in this room have seen at first hand, either because you live in such communities or you have observed what's going on in them. You know, the, the, the quiz that Haley referred to, uh, I used as a way of getting my readers to, uh, to understand the degree to which this new culture exists. Now, some of the questions in the quiz were sort of straight social science kinds of things. Uh, like, have you ever lived for at least a year uh, in a neighborhood in which fewer percent than 50% of your neighbors have college degrees? Some of them are kind of mischievous uh, questions, such as there's one question which says, have you or your spouse in the course of the last year ever stocked your fridge uh, with a mass market American beer? I ask that question because in the new upper class, uh, you don't drink Bud, you don't drink Coors, you drink a beer made in Liechtenstein uh, by, uh, by elves. Uh, you, you only, you, you know, you just don't drink. Uh, that, you know, well, there's another question, have you or your spouse ever purchased a pickup truck. But, but there are also important questions such as this. Have you ever walked on a factory floor? Not worked. Have you ever walked on a factory floor? Because an awful lot of the kids who are now no longer kids, but in their 30s and 40s, uh, have never done that. They have no idea what that is like. And if I had to pick the most important question of all, I would say it is, have you ever held a job that caused a body part to hurt at the end of the day. If you have not held such a job, you don't get most of America. Uh, you don't understand, you cannot empathize with life among people who have held or still hold jobs that cause body parts to hurt at the end of the day. Now, in a sense, the problem posed by this new upper class, which increasingly ex exists in these four metropolitan areas I described, in one sense, it's not so bad if they are people who have risen to positions of great influence but grew up in a working class family or in a middle class family because they still remember what that, that's like. You could put them off uh, in Greeley, Colorado, and the small hours in the morning and they would be able to navigate and figure out what was going on. What is scary uh, are two phenomena that have developed. One is that the people who are in these neighborhoods are no longer living in neighborhoods that adjoin more normal ones. Let me use Washington, D.C. as an example. If you start from downtown Washington, D.C., and go west toward Virginia and north toward Maryland, you have 13 zip codes in which almost all of the movers and shakers in Washington live. They either live in that part of downtown D.C., they live in Georgetown or the rest of northwest Washington, or in Bethesda, Chevy Chase, or in McLean. 13 zip codes in all. I've created an index uh, that combined the median family income in zip codes with the uh, percentage of adults with college degrees in zip codes. And I ranked all of the zip codes in the country from top to bottom. In these 13 zip codes that are all contiguous to each other in Washington, D.C., 11 of them, of them are not only in the top percent of all zip codes in the country, 11 of them are in the top half of the top 1% top of all zip codes, and the other two are in the 98th percentile. But it's worse than that, because buffering beyond those are more zip codes that stretch out into Virginia and Maryland and that encompass more than a million people, and they are in the top 5% of all zip codes. What I'm saying is that now, unlike 1960, you, if you are in Washington and you are one of the people who runs the country, you are cocooned within a very large number of zip codes that contain people who are pretty much like you and buffered from the rest of America. The same is true of the areas around New York and Los Angeles 
and Silicon Valley. The second problem that's going on is that increasingly the people who hold these positions are not people who grew up in working class and middle class neighborhoods. They are people who grew up in places like that, who have gone to K-12 for private schools or really good public schools in which probably the dumbest kid in the class was in the upper half of the intellectual distribution in this country. Why is that dangerous? It's dangerous because if you've had no direct contact with half of the country in terms of that kind of talent, you are a little bit likely to start looking down on those other people. You have no way of knowing that, you know what, those people in the bottom half of that distribution can be funny and smart and the best friends you could want to have who carry their own weight and people that you would be proud to call friends. You have no way of knowing that. You know, if you talk about why it is that we have the Bloomberg syndrome, whereby Mayor Bloomberg thinks it's his job to protect us from drinking big sodas. Uh, part of it, I think, is, is this kind of condescension that is increasing developed, increasingly developed among the new upper class about the capabilities of ordinary Americans. Uh, but beyond that, there is a fundamental problem, which is that a whole lot of people who are in cabinet positions or who are running financial institutions, or running television networks, all these other things that have such extraordinary effects on the culture and politics and economy of this country, they cannot empathize with the priorities of, let's say, truck drivers. It's not a problem if truck drivers can't empathize with the priorities of a cabinet officer or with a news anchor person, you know, because the truck driver can't affect their life. The news anchor person and the cabinet officer can affect the life and do affect the life of the truck driver and they had better know from personal experience something about what that person's life is like. Increasingly they do not. Increasingly something, we have something worse that's going on than that. Um, I've had a, the opportunity to speak to a lot of audiences since I published Coming Apart. And there's good news and bad news. The good news is that among the older members of the audience, elite audiences a lot of times, people who are a member of the new upper class, and, and I say to them such things as, to what extent are you systematically depriving your children of the experiences that made you who you are? I see lots of heads nodding. That's good. I have also encountered in audiences a lot of people who say, yeah, we're members of the new upper class. So what? What's wrong with that? And when you talk about how we're losing touch with mainstream America, well, why should I want to be in touch with mainstream America? And that leads me to my reflections on the, the final topic I want to take up. Uh, what does this all mean? A central part of the American project has been this fierce determination of Americans of all socioeconomic classes to pretend they were part of the middle class. Uh, there has been in this country a wonderful sense that you aren't supposed to get too big for your britches. Uh, those of you in this audience of a certain age will remember a time when executives who could afford to get the most expensive car that was on the market uh, would not buy them, would not buy Cadillacs, which used to be the, the, the standard of a luxury car. They wouldn't buy Cadillacs. And why wouldn't they buy Cadillacs? because it would be too ostentatious. They'd be showing off. Uh, so they bought Buicks instead. Uh, those of you of a certain age know that there was no such thing as a 20,000 square foot house or 12,000 square foot house except in a very few small neighborhoods surrounding New York City and, and Beverly Hills, California because you wouldn't want to build a house like that because that would be unseemly. It would separate you from the rest of the population in ways you didn't want because you are first of all an American, not first of all a member of a socioeconomic class. And to the extent that that is disappearing, something very important about the, American, the, the way America has been is disappearing. I'm afraid that Haley uh, oversold me when she said that I'm not one of these gloom and doom people who doesn't have solutions. Look. I'm a libertarian. Libertarians don't do solutions. Uh, this is...
the whole point of being a libertarian is that it's unnecessary. Just leave us alone and the problems will, uh, will, will, will take care of themselves. I will say this much. There is no political solution to the problems I have just described. And furthermore, there is no partisan solution to the problems I have just described. There is going to have to be a kind of cultural reformation. Uh, and by the, people say, well, you know, what does that mean and, and how can that happen? Well, it, it happens because I write books about this and that starts certain conversations and other people start to talk, have talked about this similar kind of problem, sometimes in the, in, in the confines of their family, sometimes in a plot of a sitcom on TV. But to the extent that there is a sense in the population as a whole that there are problems here and people start to talk about them, things can change. And if you don't think that things can change, just look at American history. Look, for example, at the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, we went from essentially a standing start in 1954 to the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 in a decade, all right? And the reason it was able to pass is not because you had these high-minded senators and members of the House of Representatives who rose above the objections of their, uh, of their electorates and passed this. It passed because there had been a sea change, a sea change in America's attitude toward race and race relations. You can also look at the uh, great religious great awakenings that had periodically been part of our history. There was one in the 1730s and 1740s that laid a lot of the groundwork for the revolution. There was one in the 1820s and 1830s that, that profoundly changed America's uh, civic culture for the better. There was one in the 1870s and 1880s that laid much of the moral foundation for, for events that happened uh, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. America has historically had the capacity to transform itself. And people who have tried to sell short the potential of the United States uh, to do such things have often been proved wrong. What we need now is for Americans, Republicans and Democrats alike, who share a similar affection for, allegiance to America's historic civic culture to ask themselves how much they really do treasure it. And to the extent they really do treasure it, the ways that they ought to change their lives. Um, I'm not asking for self-sacrifice here. I'm not asking for people to do things against their own interest on behalf of the rest of the country. That is really un-American. Rather, I want them to rethink uh, what that self-interest really is. Uh, for example, the, the, the new upper class has gotten really, really good at living glossy lives. They do live in these extremely high-end enclaves. Uh, they take the kids to Belize for scuba diving when they go on vacation. Uh, so if they don't travel in private jets, they travel first class. They, they have a lot of things going for them where they have very pleasant lives, but they're pretty glossy. To what extent are they no longer embedded in a community in which Human problems have to be solved. To what extent is living in your very big house on your six acres of land and not having the least idea who lives around you, to what extent does that denude your life of meaning? To what extent does not being in touch with mainstream America make your life poor? What can you do? Well, instead of going to Belize, pack the kids off to Wisconsin and go fishing in a fishing camp. Uh, bring them here to Colorado and go to uh, a dude ranch. Uh, not a dude ranch where Bill Gates goes, but a dude ranch where other ordinary Americans go. Or uh, if you're going to uh, insist on continuing to go to Aspen, don't fly there. Get in the car and drive and stay in Motel 6s and eat in diners, you know? Th this, sounds, this sounds trivial. It's not really trivial because if you have a frame of mind which says, I don't want to be isolated anymore, things that you can do to change your life become available. I want to change the moral outlook of the new upper class on their role as Americans. The betting line on this, uh, okay, if, if I had to uh, bet a significant portion of the Murray Retirement Fund, uh, I would bet pessimistically. I would say that we have a very high probability, well, no, we have a, high, we have a greater than 50% probability within 
probably my lifetime, of uh, becoming just another social democracy, like the European social democracies, which have very, very real class structures, in which there's a lot more kinship between French upper class and German and Belgian upper class than there is between the French upper class and French, quote, peasants, close quote. Uh, that could happen. It's also possible that what we have had in this country, historically, this exceptionally different way of living together, still commands the affection and allegiance which will draw large numbers of people who fight it out when they go to the polls on a variety of issues to change their, their behavior and change their ways of life. Because that's the fundamental truth about American exceptionalism that we tend to have forgotten. President Obama famously answered the question about American exceptionalism when he first came to office by saying, yes, I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I'm sure Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism and French believe in French exceptionalism. He was wrong. American exceptionalism is not something we Americans made up. American exceptionalism is something that all the world agreed existed, and uh, European commentators took the lead in the 19th century of talking about this unique civic culture that the United States had achieved. What I want is for Americans of all classes, but especially the upper class, to realize once again how exceptional that was, how unique it was among the nations of the world, and how immeasurably precious. Thank you very much. Charles Murray, and the book is coming apart. Charles Murray, American Enterprise Institute. Dr. Murray, thank you so very, very much.